Welcome back to the Film School Podcast. On today's episode, I am so thrilled to introduce you to our special guest, Karen Grassley. Karen is perhaps best known for her role as Ma in the series Little House on the Prairie, but she has a long-running acting career that has taken her literally around the world. She worked on stage uh, performing with theater groups all over London, all over Europe, and eventually was drawn out to California through promises of an independent film that ultimately fell through. She was just about to pack her bags, leave Hollywood, when she went to an audition with Michael Landon that landed her her most iconic role. We have a great conversation about her career as an actress, but also we have a really good conversation near the end about her work as an advocate. Karen has dedicated much of her life to being an advocate for women's rights, and we have a lot of great discussion about that. I'm really excited for today's episode. I know you will be as well. Thank you so much for listening. And now let's get to my interview with Karen Grassley. Filmmakers make films, but films make filmmakers. From blockbuster premieres to grindhouse theaters, late night cable to the local video store, there is no greater classroom for aspiring filmmakers than cinema itself. Join your host, Eric Skorzynski, as he dives deep into the minds of legendary directors, producers, actors, and more to discover their biggest influences and to explore the impact their films are leaving behind. This is Film School. Grab your popcorn. Class is about to begin. You know, on this show, I really like to go back to the beginning, the biggest inspirations for, you know, the people that we've gotten to know and love on screen. Uh, What were some of the earliest things that prompted a connection in you to acting and performing? I had a most marvelous dancing teacher. She was um, named Barbara Brent. That was her stage name. And she showed up in the little town where I grew up with this black hair and this red lipstick and a very taut dancer's body. And she started teaching at this uh, little studio that was there. And then she opened her own studio and we just flew to her. And I was with her for, I don't know, six, seven years. And she encouraged us to get out and perform in public and took us uh, to various institutions where we would entertain the folks And those included the girls' school. That was for girls who'd gotten in trouble. And um, we also went to the local insane asylum um, for people who hadn't found the right treatment, I suppose. Mm. And um, we, we learned how to present ourselves and how to deal with audiences, you know, and, uh, She was so glamorous when we went to these things. She would show up with very vivid colors, you know, like a turquoise. Look, I'm wearing turquoise, a turquoise (laughs) scarf and a royal blue dress. You know, it was like, oh, my God, who puts those colors together? You know, so she was a tremendous influence. And I remember at one point she said to me, Stick with show business, baby. <laughs> yeah, you, you you mentioned from in your book from a very early age overcoming stage fright. Like that was something that was gone very quickly. How did you overcome mm. that? How did you have that that personality where performing was natural for you? I never overcame the stage fright, mm. but I learned to accept it. Hmm. as part of the whole thing because you know I had the opportunity to read about other actresses and dancers and uh, one of them that I read about threw up before every single performance Hmm. and I thought well if she can live with that you know I can live with some butterflies yeah and what, what what made it worth pushing through that? Like, what was the, you know, obviously there's all the feelings of fear or of nervousness or, you know, even to the point of wanting to throw up before getting on the stage. What was the feeling that made that worth it? Was it, was it feel, you know, hearing an audience applaud, you know, was it uh, just standing up under the lights? Like, what was it that made you push through? That is such a good question. It was the joy, hmm. the joy of doing it. The sense of mm, transforming, 
mm-hmm. and transcending yourself so that you were in another space and offering something to the world, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was so, so rewarding that I just loved it. I just loved it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think love uh, helps you overcome many, many fears and hurdles. Hmm. Yeah, you, I've heard you talk about it many times as a spiritual experience, you know, performing. And, you know, it seems like through your entire life, you know, as a as a young child pursuing, you know, the church and, you know, pursuing all these different religious spiritual experiences, it seems like that pursuit and the pursuit of acting are one and the same for you. It's It was a very, it was a search for these transcendent spiritual experiences. Um, when was the first time that you felt that come together where it was like, okay, this is beyond just, oh, I'm standing or I'm performing. This has elevated into the spiritual realm for me. It was when I really sensed my calling hmm. and knew that I had a vocation. Hmm. So, so that I sensed that there was something bigger going on here than just that I thought it was a lot of fun to act, <laughs> that I was that I was giving myself to something larger. Mm. And that was when I was um, 19 or 20, mm. and I dropped out of school and joined a theater. Yeah. Was, was, were, there, were there any films that were inspiring? Because I know theater was your first love. That was what, you know, watching people perform – Um, were there any films that you're watching where you're watching performances that were drawing you in, or was it purely just those experiences of of watching people perform on stage? Oh, well, I was so crazy about the movies, you know, in our little town, that was the main entertainment that was Mm. available. And for the first few years that I was looking for entertainment, there there wasn't even television. We didn't have a television in our home. So we had radio. And we had the movies Mm. and I went to the movies as often as my parents would let me. And I was so crazy about those musicals. I mean, Gene Kelly, Debbie (laughs) Reynolds. I mean, these people were just so great. Yeah. Um, And I also had a kind of appreciation for a grittier kind of acting, you know, Mm. like, Betty Davis. I just knew that was really good acting. And I don't know how I knew that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just something you feel when you watch Mm -hmm. a certain performance. Uh, You've talked about the, the influence of the red shoes um, and which I, which your book is actually prompted me to watch it for the first time. It's been on my watch list for a long time. And uh, I I thought it was interesting um, after reading your book you know, one of the lines of the movie, they say, you know, dance is a religion, you know, and they talk about, um, you know, just that, that drawing to wanting to perform and that feeling torn between your life and performing and and the arts. Uh, How impactful was seeing that for the first time? Because it it seems like that was kind of the, uh, a good descriptor for your life and a lot of the emotions that you felt. I was so carried away by that film Mm. and it would come every year to our little town. Mm. So every year I would rush to see it. And then afterward, I would dance around, dancing her part, you know, and being driven by the master and, oh, just so crazy. And, you know, um, the conflict that she had between her fiancé not wanting her to dance and her not being able to resist dancing killed her that's how big it was you know um when the master first said to her um why do you want to dance she said why do you want to live Hmm. so it was that deep in her you know and i just felt that passion yeah and uh then of course later as a Young woman, I felt the conflict when I wanted to give it so much to my work 
and at the same time try to be like a good young wife and so on. Mm. Did, did that feeling and that conflict feel like it started earlier? I know the relationship with your father, you know, had you know many ups and downs and 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 struggles there, and he was one of the first people that identified that you wanted to do this as a career. Um, you, you mentioned. Did you feel that conflict with him early on between, okay, I want to pursue this, but you know, maybe there's a push to pursue something else that that seemed more logical or or seemed like a simpler, more traditional path? Well, my parents' role in this was that of the people who had struggled and struggled to build a solid sort of lower middle class life, really. And all they wanted for us was to give us a good education and see us have a secure career. Um, They certainly, my mother liked to work, and they certainly never thought that I should just stay at home and be a wife. But they, Hmm. uh, I don't mean just be a wife, but you know what I mean. Um, And and so I uh, always thought I would work. But it was not in our cards Hmm. to do something like go into the theater. It was too unsteady, too chancy. And so that was definitely a feeling that I had from them. And that helped me to hide from myself Hmm. how much it meant to me. So it wasn't until I was 19 or 20 that I finally said, yeah, this is it. I got to do this. It's a place I, I find a lot of creatives find themselves where, you know, there's the cultural expectation of what they should be doing or the parents pushing, you know, it's that age old story of the parents want them to be a doctor and they want to be an actor or, or, um, you know, someone's it, even religiously speaking, you know, I want to dance, but I'm told I can't dance, you know, and yeah. that's been the theme of many different movies and, and shows and, and different stories. Um, you know, for you getting to that point where it's like, I can't hold back. I have to try this and see where this goes. How liberating was that to first step out and and try to do that? Or was it purely terrifying, you know, taking that first step and cutting that cord? It was both. It was fantastically liberating to surrender to this thing that I'd been hiding from myself. And then I had to overcome the terror of making the phone call to the theater company to see if there was some way I could get involved, you know. And then when the door opened, it was a tremendous thrill. And I was so lucky because this theater company here in San Francisco was excellent. Mm. And I began to learn what I wanted to learn. And I began to know, oh, how much more I was going to have to learn. Hmm. Uh, so my path was set from that point. Well, what did you discover that you needed to learn? Well, I didn't know really what acting was, you know. Hmm. I mean, I, I had a gift, but this company showed me the range of plays, everything from Shakespeare to the most avant-garde plays at that time by Harold Pinter or Edward Albee. And I wanted to be able to do all of that. And I was reading books about acting and I wanted to know how to transform and not play the same kind of part over and over and over, but be able to be unrecognizable in a part. Mm. And, um, I knew that I needed more technical training, you know, as far as um, my voice. I had a little California accent (laughs) and a little high up voice. Does it work for Shakespeare? Only for a few parts. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So I knew I needed this classical training as well as to go back to Berkeley and study the literature. So I just wanted to do all of that. How essential do you think it is to start with these foundational, you know, works like a a Shakespeare or getting to learn these very classic pieces? Do you think that's something that every actor should get comfortable with first? Uh, Do you think that's a good starting point? You know, you can't say what any other actor should do. Mm. Um, 
some actors just have to pursue the career right away. You know, that's what they have to do um, for whatever reason. And uh, some actors are interested in being chameleons and being able to change, change, change. Um, and some actors are going to get a kind of uh, contemporary training and that's what they want to do. So you just can't say what the path should be. Yeah. I found it very enriching to have this wonderful relationship with Shakespeare and to be able to train in London and to uh, see actors of all stripes there, you know, beautifully trained and that was important to me. But then you take um, someone who, for whatever reason, is an instant star. That person is very unlikely to go back to college to study yeah. or to take a year off and do classical training. Well, they don't need to. They can still act and give a um, you know, marvelous performances and give a great gift to their audience. Mm. So, you know, there isn't any right way to do it, yeah. just as there isn't any right way to do a scene. Yeah, it, it's it's wild reading through your book because obviously myself and so many know of you as, I mean, we grew up watching Caroline on Little House on the Prairie and you know, that's a, that's a portion of your story. That's a portion of your book and, you know, reading through, you know, just your time with the theater company traveling and performing. I was like, this is like three lifetimes of experience poured in. I'm like, you're in this country and doing this and at this party and with these people. And there's not a lot about sleeping. It's just to totally just going and going, going and performing do you think that just having those experiences, getting outside of the country, going out, was that as was that as beneficial to you as an actor later on to be able to pull from those experiences? Was that more valuable than even getting on stage and learning how to perform? Gee, I couldn't say more, but incredibly enriching. Mm. When I when I got the grant to go study in London and I was able to travel in Europe, I mean, it just blew my mind to mm. see the art, to understand what the Renaissance was, to, you know, to see Rome. <laughs> I mean, yeah. these places that you've read about, you know, your whole life, and there they are. I mean, it's just, it just was so, so deeply, deeply uh, meaningful to me. Mm. And then, of course, you bring whatever your experience is whether it's your own personal trauma or whether it's being able to walk in the Coliseum, hmm. you bring that with you to whatever you do. I want to talk a little bit about transitioning from the theater side into Hollywood, because you had a, a very similar story to many in that coming to Hollywood promised one thing that quickly uh, was pulled out from underneath. You came a promise of a film and then spent a lot of time auditioning, trying to land something and were ready to quit and go back and study psychology and be done with, with acting uh, for good. Um, you know, in the moment that you, you know, got the audition for Little House on the Prairie, what was the, did you, did you feel any optimism at all? Or was it like, okay, this is my last, you know, I'll do one last audition, see if it works out. If not, I'm out. Well, I didn't know. I had uh, decided to try to get some TV work. Mm -hmm. And my mom had loaned me the money to get new photos. And the agent had the photos. And he called and said, there's this new series, Little House on the Prairie. I didn't know what that was. And he said, and, and it's being directed by Michael Landon. And he's becoming a pretty good director. Mm. And I was so out of touch with popular culture that I said, well, which one of the brothers is he? Yeah. You know, I mean, he was one of the biggest stars in the world. And I was like, which one is he? 
<laughs> so, all right, little Joe. And then I had um, a lot of fear going for the audition. Of course, I wanted it um, at the same time that it wasn't, you know, my, my dream job. I wanted the job. Hmm. And so I was quite nervous. Um, and it's so remarkable that I was at the end of my rope. Hmm. And here this landed, you know. It's one of those things, obviously, you know, when you're reading through your story, how it ends up, you know, you know that you end up landing yeah. it, but you could feel that stress and that, that tension of what if not. Um, but it was very quickly in the audition process that you pretty much felt like you got it. And I mean, Michael Lennon from the beginning was pretty adamant that you had the part. It was incredible. It was a lot of fun. First of all, I arrived and there weren't any other actresses yeah. in the room. I was like, what's going on here? I didn't know. They had already seen everybody in Hollywood who was right for this part. Hmm. So they were very solicitous and kind and brought me into the room. And uh, we had the interview. And at the interview, I kind of ran through my experience which ends with, you know, a Broadway show that closes and uh, Shakespeare in the park that runs two weeks and then it's over. And then uh, a film that brought me to California that falls through. And, you know, and I'm laughing and saying, I know uh, this is what happened. And I left there and I said, oh, my God, I told them I'm a loser. What have I done? <laughs> And then I had an insight hmm. suddenly, and I said, well, Karen, you told them the truth. And if they don't want you, this isn't the right job for you. Hmm. So that was great. Before I got home, the agent was calling, saying, go back to the studio, pick up the sides they want you to read tomorrow. Hmm. And he said, Karen, I think we can get this one. So I went back, I got the sides, and I went to read the next day. And again, no other actresses are there. And Mike sat down on the floor next to me. I was sitting on the couch and read with me, and he's just, you know, staring at me. And uh, that was somewhat unnerving. And uh, so I just try to keep my focus and read the first scene and then he said good and then we read the next scene and that's when he leapt off the floor and said send her to wardrobe and I was like oh my god did I did I get the part mm -hmm. just like that and then Ed Friendly our co-producer said uh uh, uh my could I speak to you for a minute? And I thought, uh-oh, maybe he doesn't like me for the part. So they said, Karen, do you mind just going over? And well, they took me over to Mike's office and had me sit there. And I was like, what's happening? Do they want me or not want me? And oh, my God. And then they had me come back in. And they were still smiling, smiling. And, oh, um, just thank you so much for coming in. And no word about you've got the part. But there was something in Mike's eyes that I thought, I think, I think so. I think so. And so when I got home, I found out they wanted me to do a test for the network executives in New York. And I was so let down. I wanted to go with that easy one, you know, yeah. got the part. But we set up a closed circuit interview. Mike thought it would be stupid looking to have me trying to play a pioneer without wardrobe and sets and all that. So we did an interview. And again, before I got home, the network had approved me. Wow. Phew. I got to stay in show business. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, was when you first looked at the part of 
of Ma and you're reading those lines and you're, you're looking at it initially, you didn't, you weren't very fond of her character and um, you, you saw her as just being, you know, kind of antagonistic and, and, and look, saw it as a fairly negative role. Do you, you know, looking back now, do you feel like that is how she was written largely, or do you think that's just something that you were putting onto the character from those first few lines or the first few episodes? Like, where did that feeling come from? I hadn't seen the whole script yet. So when I got the whole script, then I saw this young, handsome husband who's playing the violin and making jokes and the girls are all dancing. And then Ma is saying, uh, Charles, you know, reprimanding. And uh, when they're getting to the place that he says, Carolyn, we're home. She's like, oh, this is it. You know, so when I read that, I was like, oh, this isn't going to get me much other work. I mean, (laughs) this woman's kind of negative and golly, I don't know. I mean, he's so darling and she's kind of stiff and prim and And then I went to work. And on the very first day, I got a sense of her that was totally different. Because here we were, leaving the big woods. She was saying goodbye to her mother and father that she might never see again. She didn't know how far they were going or where they would wind up. She didn't know whether there would be Indian raids along the way. She was terrified. She had her three little girls in the wagon. And I was like, oh, I get it. This woman is very loyal and very brave. She's going. And so my shift happened right then. And from then on, you know, I was always looking for how she was strong, how she was a good partner, how she uh, eventually came to accept Mr. Edwards, for example. Yeah. You know, did you feel like you had a lot of freedom to do that, to bring in those moments? Because you mentioned that first scene, you know, leaving home, you know, not maybe you won't see parents again. And you talk about, you know, doing a, that, the smile that you give to him as you're pulling away. That's uncertain. Mm -hmm. Um, Were those moments that were almost always you bringing that into the character, you had the freedom to bring that in, or was that, was any of that put into the script given to you to work with in the beginning? Well, that little smile, for example, was just came out of my feeling, you know, of, of trying to let him know, you know, I'm on board, but it's not easy here. Um, And then the fact that Mike, gave me positive feedback meant okay keep it yeah and go with it and the the more uh he uh, recognized something that i did as good or you know liked it the more i felt i could bring to the character and that was wonderful in the pilot because there were so few of us you know yeah. just the family and then mr edwards and so we had this intimacy and uh, he could give a lot of uh, feedback. Oh. And I got the feeling that things were going well. How different was the experience of doing television as opposed to preparing for, you know, stage performing? It was a big adjustment. Um, the fact that you got so little rehearsal hmm. uh, was an adjustment. And I was grateful then for the summer stock I had done and the winter stock where I'd done a play a week um, and where I had been an understudy and had to go on with no notice um, so that those things were available to me, you know, in my toolkit of being quick. Um, And I was grateful that it was easy for me to learn lines, but learning lines for this pilot, I. I mean, I just had to sit down, write everything out over and over 
so I could check myself because there was n- no rehearsal to speak of, you know. Mm. Um, we were off and running. So <laughs> that was, I think it was continuity that was the biggest challenge. Mm. Being sure that I knew where she had been before and where she was going next in the yeah. story so that I, so that, so that my choices would make sense, you know. Right. Yeah, you're trying to anchor it to something to to make it natural. Um, you you mentioned talking, you know, in, in trying to bring life to this character. You know, you you say you base a lot of your performance on your own mother. Um, yeah. You know, you talk about the strength and devotion and intelligence there. What elements specifically were you bringing into that role? And were there any certain maybe life experiences that you can say in a scene of the show like that right there is a very clear me pulling on that memory or on that connection. Oh yeah. Yeah. So when Mike Charles went off to Mankato, no, when he went off to, I forget which thing it was, maybe it was to do the dynamiting. It was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. It was one of those shows where he was going to do something very dangerous because we needed money so bad. Yeah. And the, the script said something like, Carolyn is sitting by the fire worried. I was like, no. So I talked with Mike about it. I said, you know, my mother lived with a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And she would be up cleaning the drawers, cleaning <laughs> the house, polishing the furniture, uh, there would be no stone unturned while she worked through that. Mm -hmm. And he loved that. So then we built that in. That, that collaboration between you and Michael Landon in the first season sounds so fulfilling. I mean, the, the relationship that you describe and the, the back and forth and the input that you were sharing seems that collaboration just seems like a, a dream. Um, you know, and then in the later seasons, you know, you've talked very openly about, you know, as contract negotiations happened, as the show became more successful, as the schedules became more intense, that relationship really began to fracture and and it became pretty toxic for you um, working with the show, trying to make sure that you, your voice was heard and, and you were there in those, you know, first times where that started deteriorating, did that cause a lot of resentment toward the show itself? Did you feel like, okay, now I'm stuck in this cycle of, you know, doing the show and, and uh, you know, what, what was the, how did that affect your experience overall? Yeah, that was really too bad. You know, um, it was all about the contract. It was all mm-hmm. about that. I wanted a raise and I wanted to be paid a fair salary like other people in top 10 shows. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why Mike was so set against it. I mean, it's so crazy. It's, you know, it's not like it was going to hurt his financial position. It just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, he was against it. And he did not want to share in that way. Mm -hmm. And... So a series of diminishing behaviors and uh, fewer scenes and cutting away from the character and so on began to happen. And that was so so painful because I did feel, oh, my God, I am trapped here. I cannot leave. You know, I, I, I was the kind of kid who... You know, I'd get in fight with my parents and I would leave and I would slam the door and make it, you know, two blocks away. But I couldn't leave. There were only three networks. And there was a big to do at the time because in All in the Family, Sally Struthers was trying to get out of her uh, deal there. And uh, it was going to go to court. It was in the trades all the time. And, you know, you could see this was, this was really very serious move to make. 
Well, and it would be career poison. You know, even if you won the the battle, you know, the war of your career, I mean, it would be done. It would be over. That's right. Because if you can walk out on a successful series, who's going to put you in a successful series again? Yeah. So you said it. So there I was. And um, I just felt very um, mm, trapped is a good word for it. Mm. I just, I, I just. Oh my God, I, I, I tried very hard to rise above and be a professional and blah, blah, blah. And, but it went on so long, you know, and it was really then of four, course, four seasons or so. It, it went on for over two seasons. Two seasons. Mm-hmm. I can't, mem- can't remember exactly um, the day it was settled. But I was sure that it wouldn't take long. Yeah. You know, and so I was surprised when it went on and on and on. And then, of course, I had an alcohol problem. So I had to drink over that. I mean, you'd drink too, wouldn't you, if you had that problem? And Michael Landon was down on you and the rest of the people were starting to shy away from you and uh, you still had to show up there and you know, the heat and dust. (laughs) Right. For parts that weren't fulfilling, you know, for for a scene where you're pouring, you know, you're pouring something and leaving the scene, you know, that's not a fulfilling (laughs) day of work as, as an actor. Um, You remember that about the coffee. (laughs) Your, your book does a great job of imparting the stress you were feeling onto the reader. Uh, Going through and going, I can't. Yeah, I remember you talking about, uh, you know, zooming in on the coffee. So not even to show your face. And I just, and then you described the morning sitting and doing wardrobe for hours and, get, you know, getting ready. And I, I just, I can't imagine the the feeling during that time. And I, I, I'm curious because like you, everybody has a fond recollection of the show as a viewer, you know, and, and for so many, it was a staple, you know, and it's still a staple. I mean, it, it's playing like if you turn on the TV right now, some channel somewhere probably is playing or about to play an episode. And there's a, there's a general fondness. And for you, you obviously, you know, you obviously don't shy away from the pleasant moments. It was a huge moment in your career. When you look back though, what's the emotion you feel toward that experience as a whole? Is it, is it, is it complicated? Is it gratefulness for what it did for you good and bad altogether like what what do you see when you see an episode come across your screen or you see someone you know talking about how much they love the show uh, what what are your memories or, or feelings toward it now Eric that is such a wonderful question because these past years in the process of completing this book and uh, going through the experience again, um, and knowing too that Mike and I had settled things before he died mm-hmm. um, meant a lot to me. But there was a hurt place inside me. Um, and I had worked and worked to heal this place. But I still had some kernel of it in me. And then when the book came out and I saw what other people have known, but I didn't get how this character had imprinted herself on people's hearts. How those days when I didn't want to go to work, but I showed up and I did my best had meant something. Mm. You know, yeah. that was unbelievable gift to me. Yeah. So now I can fully accept what ma means to people and embrace it, you know, with no, nothing held back. Yeah. I, I was, I was fascinated to, to get your response to that because I've listened to so many interviews with you now preparing for this and so many questions about, you know, what was Michael Landon really like on set or what was it like doing this? But 
you know, what was it like at the time? And I was curious now in retrospect, what those feelings were, because again, like you, you describe Michael Landon and portions of the book so lovingly of, you know, here's this memory of him leaping up and saying, Senator wardrobe, you know, and there's those moments that are career defining moments. Uh, but then at the other hand, you know, your story is also a story of a, a female actor in Hollywood trying to navigate a system that power structures when it came to, to pay and to contracts. And so I, I was curious what the feelings were, if it was a, how complicated it was or, or what the thoughts were there. Um, but that's, that's an interesting perspective for sure. I'm so glad you asked me because before the book came out, there was a lot I didn't say. Yeah. I just, I just didn't say how it had been. Mm. I let people have their little house on the prairie experience. (laughs) And I didn't say too much. When I was with the other actors, sometimes the degree to which they would talk about how uh, it was like paradise, I would be like, oh, well. I'm going to step over here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's difficult too. Cause I mean, the majority of the cast you were around, especially in the early years were children, you know? And so their memory would be very different. It's very much like growing up in a family, you know, listening to you describe it because you were her for all intents and purposes. It was, I mean, you were together throughout the day, you know, growing together. Right. And so it's just right. like when you, it's just like when you become an adult and your mom tells you something about your dad and you're like, what? <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine that he was perfect. What are you talking right. about? Right. Um, you know, uh, right. but no, I want to, I want to know your perspective on that. And it, it, one thing that, that is so clear is that there are many people who, you know, before your book saw you as Caroline, like that was who they saw you as in, in, if you look at negative reviews of the book, I mean, it's people who are shocked that you don't fit the persona of who they think Caroline yeah. is. Um, you know, when you talk about activism or, you know, the the speaking out, using your voice and not being this, you know, quiet or subdued person, um, it bursts some bubbles, you know, I think uh, for people. Um, so I, I definitely want to talk about that because you were doing something in the time period of the show, you were using your platform in a way that, you know, this was a long time before the Me Too era or a time where it was in, uh, it was at all acceptable. It's still very frowned upon to come out and speak about these topics of domestic abuse or about, uh, you know, the abuse of women, but you were using your platform from pretty much day one after the success of the show to do this. Um, what drove you to this and um, you know, how important was that to you? Because it, in the book, it's very much, you're either talking about being on set or going out and speaking on these topics. I needed a way to define myself in addition to Ma. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I had always been this little feminist from the time I was a kid Right. Really, they remember that from school. Yeah. So uh, it was natural that I was looking for a woman's issue. And it came to me when I was out promoting Little House on the Prairie. I, would, I was the chief promoter for our show because Mike had to work mm-hmm. on so many areas. And, of course, the children couldn't be expected to do sure. that. So I was in Fort Worth, Texas, and I met this journalist who started describing a series of articles she had just done on battered wives. And I was completely shocked. I was like, I had no idea. I thought this was limited to people who were very poor or very uneducated. Um, I had no idea that this cut across all class lines, all races, all religions. Right. So I was passionate then. This had to be the subject. And my writing partner, Cynthia Lovelace Sears, agreed with me. This was the one. So we began work. And what an education we got yeah. from yeah. these women. You know, it was unbelievable. And we were very lucky because one of the two two shelters in the whole country 
was within an hour's drive Hmm. of where we were. This isn't too long ago. And there was two shelters to, to choose from, you know, for this, this sort of thing. And, um, and putting this, this project together, um, you know, was it, was it something where you were instantly were like, okay, this is uh, the medium in which I want to do this. Cause you, you had talked about in one of your interviews that, you know, the movie of the week was where you cover a social topic was becoming very popular across different networks. Was that instantly where you put that connection and said, okay, I want to put battered out onto, you know, as a movie of the week, bring awareness to it. Um, or did it have any other form like a, were you thinking about different ways to distribute it or get that message out? No, I knew that my particular clout was in television, Yeah, you know, and I had just gotten it. So that's, that was definitely the playground for me. Yeah. And I knew that uh, the success of Little House on the Prairie could boy this project. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating. It came together. I mean, and it was not easy <laughs> for you on the backside of this as well, trying to get it out. Um, I, it's ironic that a that a project like this would be uh, attempted to be taken over by a male male producing team and writing team and trying to trying to rework it. But I mean, the the cast is incredible. I watched it a, a few days ago. You know, Mike Farrell off of MASH, you know, and you've got LeVar Burton, which, you know, it's, you know, fascinating seeing, you know, the guy from the Reading Rainbow in a role like this, you know, and and it's a, I mean, it's a really well-made movie. You know, there were a lot of um, uh, made-for-TV uh, movies that, you know, <laughs> didn't cover anything, you know, transgressive at all or get into topics like this. And again, like I, I you know, I've been for the last two years, I've been doing advocacy work when it comes to sexual abuse by clergy. And oh, it's, yeah. it's, a uh, it's, it's difficult now to get people to listen to you, to uh, get the message out, to not, to not have people upset, you know, I get very angry messages and comments and, and thoughts on it. Um, and during this time period, it's, it's fascinating to me that you were taking the charge on this. Um, it's, it was a really powerful section to me in your book. And it was, it was something that was completely unexpected when I, when I came across it. Thank you. And and congratulations on your advocacy. Um, when you talk about the blowback that you get, is that from people who are offended that you take the church to task? Yeah, it's, that's a lot of it for sure. The religious side affects it. I mean, because that's an institution that you know, people don't want touched, you know, there's a, it's a, it's something that means something to them. Um, And so, and, and I understand that, you know, I, I grew up in that same world. So I understand those, those feelings, but it also doesn't negate the problem that's there. You know, you have to talk about it. Um, And again, just having the conversation, I think moves us a long way. Um, But it's, it's sad. I mean, I, I mean, you talk about the equal rights amendment, you know, the fact that it's still, you know, every year you could record an interview saying, and it's still not there. <laughs> it's still not there. Um, it, we have so much work to do. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to get your take on that before we kind of move into the the close here, because um, I definitely want to make sure we took time to talk about your advocacy work, um, you know, and, you know, the Me Too movement has took off in full swing a few years ago, which for many who've been advocates for a long time, you know, that that's been a shock to see it talked about this openly, to see conversations like this happening. I spoke with someone a while ago who, you know, was trying to start a rape crisis center in the seventies, you know, and how, how difficult uh-huh. that was. Um, what is the me too movement really meant for you? What has seeing people come out and be able to be outspoken in these areas? What has that meant to you as someone who has been advocating this for, for so long? It's, it actually has been fantastic. Um, so grateful to these young women who broke it open, you know, and the others who came on board. I'm just so, so grateful um, because I do believe that they are making real change. Yeah. And uh, I think this is fantastic, just yeah. fantastic. Um, also, um, because I was not physically assaulted, I didn't feel uh, that my story uh, had the same 
punch hmm. that theirs had. But listening to everything, talking it over with a friend of mine who's a psychologist, I realized this is harassment as sure as a physical assault. No. What happened to me? Um, because I had to face work every day in this atmosphere. And um, I was talking to uh, Megan Kelly in an interview recently, and she said, yeah. Karen, it's part of the law. Yeah. That creating a negative environment is harassment. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> you know, so right. what happened to me was before Anita Hill. Yeah. Brave, brave woman who, you know, they just really shredded her. And um, here she is. She's still working. You know, mm -hmm. she's still fighting. Yeah. What a tremendous role model. Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, there was a documentary just recently. Um, I think it's called Anita, um, but it's it's a fascinating, fascinating documentary. And Again, it's it's these people that go out in front and share their story, and years later, uh, society catches up, you know, and is still catching up in in so many ways. Um, but I, yeah, I just wanted to thank you. I mean, in your book, spending so much time, you, you could have written a version of your book that was very uh, uh, just uh, glossy, <laughs> a glossy view. You could have sold with a a picture of you on the cover. You could have sold plenty of copies of my experience on Little House on the Prairie and kept it just on the positives of it. And I appreciated that you were, I think, balanced and fair, but also authentic about your experience and took so much time to talk about, um, you know, your work as an advocate in the end of, of the book, I thought was really, was really helpful and, and powerful. Um, and you've a lot, a lot of time in interviews to talk about as well. So, so thank you for that. Um, I think that's, that's commendable. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, I, I know we're getting near the, the end of our time here and I like to, um, I like to end every one of these with a quick uh, rapid round, uh, asking a couple quick questions uh, and getting some quick answers. So first of all, uh, what of your work, you know, we talked a little bit about the spiritual experience of acting uh, when you look at your, your career and you look at all the different work on stage, on screen, uh, which, uh, which of these projects best exemplifies who you are as a creator? Oh, a really easy question <laughs> to think about. Well, I couldn't uh, possibly say because it's a conglomeration, you know, mm -hmm. but surely because of the media, uh, because of television, surely Ma has had the biggest impact on other people. Yeah. Um, and for me, you know, the most rewarding has sometimes been in a play that maybe mm, 2000 people saw. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I was curious what your, uh, I was curious if it was something that as a 19 year old, you had this moment that you've chased ever since, or if it was something that, you know, was, would be unexpected because I, that's such an interesting difference between the mediums is, you know, you've got something that is a one night only, like someone only saw that performance one time, even if they saw the play a second time, they only saw that one, one time. It's such an interesting thing as opposed to film or television, which lasts forever. You can see that same thing beat for beat. Um, what's a, what's a movie that fans of yours would be surprised that you enjoy? Mm, um. Oh gosh, um, this new movie, Don't Look Up. I like that mm. movie a lot. Strong satire in that. Yeah. I, I really like that. I don't think they'd be surprised that I like um, The Lost Daughter, mm. which I saw twice because I think it's so fantastic. Is, is that a newer film or an older film? Yeah, it's brand new and... Oh. Uh, and it's getting wonderful raves and it's on Netflix. Okay. I'll have to add it to my list. Um, yeah. uh, what is the best decade of film history? Oh, oh I don't know, but I like the forties and fifties, mm. you know, I love noir. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, the, the, the red shoes set me off um, on watching uh, a, quite a few different movies from Michael Powell and uh, Emmerich Pressburger. And it's the forties was just a time period. Like I, I've watched a lot from the thirties. I've watched a lot from uh, like the sixties and seventies, the fifties I've seen a lot, but I'm not a huge fan of the fifties as a decade of, of film, but the forties, there's some fascinating filmmaking and Michael Powell. Now I'm like, Oh, he's one of the greatest directors of all time. <laughs> and I had never, I had never seen anything of his at all. Um, and uh, so congratulations, your mention of the red shoes uh, got me started on that kick. So uh, I owe that to, uh, I owe that to your book. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in the filmmaking because it's ahead of its time. It feels like some of the work being done in the seventies, you know, is, Mm -hmm. is happening uh, within those movies. So it's, it's a fascinating period for sure. Um, If, uh, if you were to given the green light to remake any film or any TV series uh, and you could be a part of that, what would you choose and why? Um, Oh, Oh, what a wonderful question. Uh, I think I would like to remake, um, as a director, a film of Joan of Arc. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what would your your angle on it be, or what would your, your take on it be? What would you like to see? I don't know. <laughs> I have to find it. You know, I have to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If uh, what's the best piece of advice? So for someone who would be an aspiring filmmaker, uh, what's the number one piece of advice that you would give them? Uh, for an aspiring filmmaker. Oh, just to uh, learn everything they can, hmm. not just about the medium, but about themselves and this world that we're in you know to really really educate themselves on it in a deep way right right um and i have to ask uh one more question i forgot to ask you earlier um but was there um when you were working on the character i know you weren't familiar with the books at the time um but have you read through the little house series since um and was it something you did in preparation for the character once you landed the part, or is it something in retrospect that you went through and and read them and, and how did that interpret your, your view of the character? I started reading as soon as I got cast. Okay. Yeah. I started reading the first two books as soon as I got cast, trying to find, you know, who, who who was she? Right. Who was she? And there's really not that much information. Yeah. You know, so I was thrown back on my own mom and her primitive experiences, you know, in the countryside and being a one room schoolhouse teacher and being tough. Um, uh, And after that, I appreciate the books, uh, especially as for young people. Yeah. Mm, I just think they offer so much. Um, Yes, there are things in there that are negative about Native Americans. Can't we learn to see these things in context rather than try to delete them from our experience? I mean, uh, this disturbs me that people want to delete or or ban what they don't like or, or don't understand. Sure. And um, Ma had her frailties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's part of humanity. Yeah. That's part of who we are. We're always growing and, and learning. Um, and I'm, I'm curious for my last question, what, you know, you had some control over the story lines um, in the later seasons, you got to explore some things that were again, ahead of their time and, and took the opportunity to talk about, conversations like equal rights and and things like that. Were there any, was there anything that you wanted to approach or any storylines that you wish you could have covered um, throughout the course of the show that you just never got to over those seasons? Yes, there was. I wanted to do something about friendship between women. Hmm. And I wanted to do something about a woman when she gives too much of herself and she 
as she breaks down. I wanted to do that mm. also. Actually, I didn't have any control. Um, mm. Truth be told. <laughs> so you, you got permission to have a moth-centered story, but you weren't in control of what that story would be. That's right. Gotcha. That's right. Oh, yeah. The illusion of control in a, in a lot of, a lot of cases. <laughs> Um, no, I, I really appreciate having this conversation with me and for, for taking the time to do this and, and for your book, your book is truly, uh, an incredible, incredible book. And, um, you know, I always joke, you know, when someone talks with somebody, uh, you know, they, when they see a bad performance in a movie, they can say, oh, the lighting was nice <laughs> or, or with a book, oh, I like this section, but I can truly say, um, it's a, it's a really fantastic book. It, it made me appreciate, you know, I was obviously someone very familiar with you beforehand, but it really made me a fan of you as a person, you know, beyond what you see on screen. Um, I'm, I just truly loved it. I've recommended it to a few people already. And oh, uh, thank I, you so yeah, much, Eric. It's, it's, it's excellent. And um, I thank you again for taking the time to have this conversation. It was, it was fantastic. Oh, I enjoyed it so much. Your questions were so interesting. Oh, thank you. And uh, for anybody listening, I mean, definitely uh, grab a link in the show notes, uh, pick up a copy of the book. It's, it's fantastic. And it's a, I think it's a must read for anybody interested in, you know, Little House on the Prairie, obviously it's, it's fascinating, but even beyond that, if you're interested in acting, if you're interested in Hollywood during that time, if you're interested in just life, like an interesting uh, autobiography. It's it's a must read. So definitely grab a copy. And and Karen, thank you again for, for having this conversation. It means the world to me. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for listening to the Film School Podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, don't forget to leave a five-star review and hit subscribe so you won't miss a single episode.